Ave Maria, the following program discusses adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Just a little prayer at the beginning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, pray for us. Our Lady of Perpetual Help, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I just uh, returned to the Catholic Church in the last three or four years. I should... Thank you. And that's uh, after almost 40 years away from the church. And, you know, I was just getting comfortable with my return when uh, Pope Benedict resigned. And being a little sensitive and sometimes even paranoid, I thought, did he find out that I returned to the church? (laughs) And I... I wasn't a well, very well-informed Catholic, of course, at that point. So to top it off, there, I found out there's a special word uh, for a person who returns to the Catholic faith. The person who converts to Catholicism is, of course, called a convert, but the person who returns to the faith is called a revert. <laughs> well... You're applauding, but I'll tell you, it found, I found that a very strange word. Uh, it didn't sound very flattering. In fact, it reminded me, especially in the work I do, it reminded me of another word that is uh, not very uh, flatter, flattering at all, uh, if, you, if you can think of what I'm, uh, I'm getting at. And so because of my sensitive nature, I was really caught off guard when a priest said to me, I hear you're a revert. (laughs) And in my embarrassment, I said, I've never done anything like that, Father. (laughs) The the message I'm sharing with you today is, uh, as Ken said, essentially the message that I gave at a retreat uh, this past year in Connecticut, where I'm from, at the uh, Courage uh, Retreat. And uh, so you'll notice that it's highly directed directly to SSA people themselves. And I know we have a whole group of different people in this uh, audience, but I, I truly believe, as I prayed before, giving this message and looked it over a number of times. I I truly believe that it will have some words for other people as well, and uh, you can can let me know if that's true. Uh, I believe, and I'm speaking to SSA people directly now, I believe that some of you came to this conference in a very sensitive, emotional state. Some of you are feeling unsure of yourself and why you're here. Some of you feel broken and very vulnerable. Your heart is troubled or unsettled in some way. I'm pretty sure of that. So it's good for you to be here and to know that this is a safe place to be yourself. You don't have to hide at this place, and that's one of the wonderful things about Courage and our meetings at Courage. You don't have to pretend that you're someone different than who you really are, and every one of us here is broken in some way, some sinful way. We all struggle, I do, with sexual sin. We all are somewhat unsettled and uncomfortable with who we are. I also believe you're here at this conference by God's design, really. Uh, Our good Father wanted you here. You came here for a reason that God knows about. And maybe you have not thought about the reason why you are here. It may be hidden to you. Or 
maybe you know why you're here uh, or you need some word from God about why you're here. Perhaps you're here because you know your life is just not right. It's just not hanging together the way you'd like it to. You're confused or troubled. You have some unanswered questions or you just had a sense you ought to be here. I'm saying all this because in the two days I've been here, I notice people are having wonderful fellowship and going to a lot of meetings. But I, I, I want people to know, especially people struggling with this issue, that God has brought you here for a reason, to talk with you and to speak to your heart about something. In any case, I'm certain that your being here is not accidental or incidental. I believe your loving Father, God, has some message, some spiritual message, or some work he wants to begin, or some work he wants to complete in your life. So I, I prayed for this talk that it would, uh, it would uh, speak to your hearts in a, a very spiritual way. I think the Lord does want to touch you in some way. He wants to get at that thing that you brought to this conference. What have you been struggling with, thinking about, troubled over in the last weeks, months, or years? And that question is just not for SSA people, but for everyone that is here. Try to listen closely to what the Lord may speak to you. Every summer, my wife plants a garden of vegetables and flowers. She loves gardening and puts a lot of care and love into her garden. She's getting older like I am, and so she has hip and knee problems, and so it's getting harder for her to do it. We, we have two and a half acres, so she doesn't try to tackle two and a half acres, but uh, about a, an eighth of an acre or so she, she's always working on. She makes it lovely and wonderful every every summer. Uh, I'm not so much into gardening, but I help her out as I can. But then then comes along a family of groundhogs, (laughs) also known as woodchucks, and there goes all the fresh lettuce and the greens from her garden. Well, you can get rid of groundhogs with repellents, and we tried that. It didn't work. You can use gas cartridges, tossed into their burrows. We thought that was too extreme, so we didn't try to do that. (laughs) They say you can uh, use mothballs and throw them around, but it smelled up everything. We did that one year, and everything smelled of mothballs. Or you can get, uh, maybe you know some other ways to get rid of groundhogs, but we finally got what they call a humane trap, and, uh, and that finally worked which catches them without any harm to them, and which then I transported about five miles away and released them on somebody else's property. (laughs) I'm I'm really kidding about that part. (laughs) But here's the point I want to make in telling you about our groundhog visitors. Groundhogs and most other animals have no idea what a trap is. You put cheese or peanut butter in a mouse trap and you can catch every mouse that's around. All they can focus on is the delicious looking and smelling food in the trap. All these creatures can focus on is the gratification which comes from getting at the lettuce and the carrots, the cheese or the peanut butter. So the groundhogs step into the trap They uh, step on that spring that's in the trap, which closes the gate behind them, and they're caught. Groundhogs and mice can't step back and understand that there's someone more intelligent than themselves with a plan to trap them. But humans should be able to step back and know that there is a bigger picture a larger perspective. They should understand that someone greater than themselves has a plan for their lives, but it's not a trap. He's a loving, benevolent Father God 
who has a deep interest in our lives and arranges and rules the events of our life so that all things work together for our final ultimate good. In Jeremiah 29, 11, which I'm sure a lot of you know, it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. And that's kind of what I'd like to share with you uh, as it has to do with same-sex attraction, God's plan for a person with SSA. If you're not seeing your SSA from this larger perspective, from God's perspective, his plan, it's likely that you will continue being caught in the traps of sin and gratification. Next slide, please. I'm sure you recognize the verse I referred to just now. We know that all things work together for good if you love God and are called according to his purpose. No verse in the Bible claims more than that, covers more territory, offers more hope and comfort if what this verse says is true, if you truly believe it, then every troubling condition or event in our life is under God's care, capable of producing final and lasting good for you. And that's why <clears throat> it's my favorite owned verse of the Bible. Some people say, I wish that were really true. Another say, I hope that's true. But God's word, given by the Holy Spirit, says it's true. You can count on it. If you love God and are called according to his purpose, and those are the conditions, then all things will work together, even though we don't always understand them, will work together for our good, especially our ultimate good, and that's the result. I think that we forget how real, how present, how involved God is in our lives how much more wise and loving our Father God is than we are, that he knows each of us very personally and that he has a plan for each of our lives. I think we often become preoccupied and trapped in our small, busy, distracted lives, running after lettuce and peanut butter, getting trapped over and over again and lose sight of the bigger picture. But if you're a committed Christian who's living with same-sex attraction, I'm sure that you most likely have already uh, pondered the bigger picture to some degree. Same-sex attraction causes you to ask the big questions. What is the meaning of my life? How do I make sense of my life? Who is this God who allows me to experience this issue in my life? And with this issue having such a prominent role, is it possible? Is it possible that, same, that, that my same-sex attraction is going to somehow work together for good? Can I really believe that? Do I see any evidence that this is true? This is what I want to reflect on. For, against, and with same-sex attraction is the kind of issue that doesn't allow for neutrality or superficiality. From the age of 10 or 12, it pushed its way into your life and my life and shouted, I'm here. What are you going to do about me? We call it a life-dominating issue. It touches the deep core of our being and our beliefs. It colors all of life. It insinuates itself into every day, every relationship, and every aspect of living. And ultimately, it compels you to accommodate it in what I think of as one of three ways, as I see it. You can live for it, you can live against it, or you can live with it. First, you can live for it as a committed gay person, as a sexually active person in or outside of an ongoing relationship. Call that the gay option. The loving God we know does not want this option for us. I don't believe that you can have assurance that choosing that option will work together for your ultimate good and the emphasis being on ultimate good. 
But I'm not going to make the assumption that just because some of you are here at this conference that you are not caught up in the gay option or that you're not considering the gay option or that you have considered the gay option in the past. You may very well be here with someone in your life back home who, whom you love or so tired of battling and failing with your sexual desires that you are seriously thinking of living as a gay person. So in case you are, or considering it, or are at a very confused and uncertain place, then I pray that the Lord speaks to your heart during this talk and throughout this conference. So that's the first option. You can live for it. Secondly, you can live against it, and that's where a lot of people are at. You can continue fighting with it, trying to deny, repress, suppress, segregate it, dissociate yourself from it as best as you can, experiencing repeated failure and sin. Call it the conflicted option. The loving God, we know, does not want you uh, to select that option either or to be involved in that option. He does not want us to live in constant turmoil or confusion. It's psychologically unhealthy and it's dysfunctional. That kind of option cannot work together for your ultimate good. Most people who come to counseling are in this place with their SSA. They know they don't want the gay option, but they have no peace in their life. They feel compulsively drawn to good-looking, same-sex people. They can't stop compulsive sexual behavior. Their wounded selves are hurting so much, they are desperate for love and intimacy and acceptance and belonging from someone in any form they can get it. I heard recently from a guy who's active in church ministry, respected and popular by the youth he works with, but constantly falling into sin with another man. He feels like a hypocrite, can't tolerate living a deception, seriously considering chucking the whole church thing and living as an openly gay person. That's the conflicted option or the conflicted state. Or thirdly, you can find a way to live with it in some mature, emotionally healthy morally responsible, sexually chaste, and spiritually wholesome way, which is compatible with your Christian values, your Catholic faith, and biblical faithfulness. Call it the resolution option. This is what God wants for his faithful children. And we can be sure it's the option which works together for your ultimate good. In this message, I want to explore with you what it means for a Christian to live with same-sex attraction, to pursue that resolution option, to allow God to work all things together for good. And St. Paul knew this truth, the truth of this verse very well, not by logic and reasoning when he wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but by the conviction of inner experience that comes from seeing God work in his life and circumstances when he exercised faith and trust and love for God and Jesus Christ. Next slide, please. When I shared these thoughts about the three options with that good and loving man, the late Father Harvey, sometime in the 90s, he seemed to live to like this perspective He and I corresponded a few times. He came to our regional conference. He included my writings in an anthology that he was preparing for publication. And he subsequently invited me to speak at a couple of Courage conferences. At that time, I was a a Protestant, a Lutheran. And so I felt especially uh, welcomed by him uh, that he reached across religious lines to me like that. At that time I spoke at those conferences, I was uh, a Protestant, a member of Exodus International Board, and ran a ministry in Connecticut for same-sex attraction people called Hope Ministries. 
I was also teaching clinical social work at Southern Connecticut State University. And over several years, I began to specialize in counseling SSA people because there were so many Christians seeking help with this issue and because God knew I needed to work on my own issues. And in 1991, I published a book called Homosexual No More. The group I was working with, the ministry group I was working with, started to play around with that book title and affectionately started calling it Homo Nomo. <laughs> the gay community picked up on that title and put out a couple of videos that are still on the internet. One was a kind of, and, and they didn't bother me, they were kind of humorous. One was a kind of country western song with the lyrics, can't you see the change in me? I'm homo no mo. <laughs> and another was a gay comedy monologue about a guy who graduated from an ex-gay treatment center called the Homo No Mo Halfway House. <laughs> During that time, my wife and I had been active in a Lutheran church, and, for, and that was for over 20 years. But in the last few years, since 2008, I began searching for what I thought was a better Protestant church. I was certain God was calling me to seek another uh, church experience, though my wife was very content, had a lot of friends in that church, and so she stayed in the Lutheran church. When I began that search, I never for a moment thought of returning to my Catholic faith, which I drifted away from in my late to uh, mid to late 20s. I had all the prejudices, misconceptions, and biases that so many have toward Catholicism. To return to Catholicism never entered my mind. Besides, I really didn't want to be called a revert. <laughs> but looking back, I realized that Father Harvey had one of the very first softening effects on my heart and prepared me for my return to Catholicism. That in itself, to me, is miraculous. As a young man, I was a devoted Catholic, and when I finished high school, I went right off to the seminary. But by my fourth year, the weight of living such a confining lifestyle, and this is back in the late 50s, early 60s, and my own emotional immaturity caused me to burn out and to have a breakdown. I was 23 years old. It was the worst thing and the best thing that could have happened to me. So on the eve of the Cuban Missile Crisis, October of 1961, I left the seminary. And you know I absolutely needed to break down so that I could break out of my false self and break through to an authentic life in Christ. Hebrews 12, 4, 6 says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens everyone he accepts as a son. This is when I first began to see how all things are working together for good. When this crisis came, my false self, with all its pretending and ideals, with all its efforts to maintain a face of tranquility and holiness, could no longer hold back the flood of truth which is straining to be revealed to me, the truth that I was an emotionally wounded and psychologically immature person dealing with SSA. I was forced to look at my true self without pretense for the first time. And when you grow up in a culturally dysfunctional first-generation family, Italian family like mine, you develop a false self in order to survive. We all have to face our false selves at some point in our lives. But this doesn't mean I suddenly became mature. I still was immature in a, a number of ways, and you can ask my wife, she'll be glad to tell you. <laughs> As an aside, let me say that those who, speaking of my wife, those who are married and dealing with SSA, your spouse is a major source of your sanctification. 
through her or him, God is promoting your holiness. Listen to your spouse. At the time, I didn't know that this crisis was God working in my life, that with God, we live, as Kierkegaard said, we live life forward, but we understand it backwards. I didn't know that God steps into the dark holes of our lives with us, but also from my psychological, bro but not only healing and bringing me to salvation, but also healing my psychological brokenness as well. And that amazed me. That was just, God was just not in the business of saving my soul, but he was healing my psychological brokenness. And I certainly didn't know the verse of scripture, which became my favorite verse, and that is Romans 8, 28. So this message is really all about the meaning of that verse. For three years after I left the seminary, I suffered from PTSD, that is post-traumatic seminary disorder. <laughs> I felt that God had betrayed me. All my ideals were shattered. I was disillusioned. I easily slipped into an angry agnosticism and eventually a kind of a bitter atheism. My heart became hard toward God and toward Catholicism. It just shows really how immature I was at that time. All I had was a philosophy degree. You know, when you leave seminary at that point, you don't have much to, to show. So now I took my little philosophy degree and went looking for a job. And not many people were hiring people with philosophy degrees. Can you operate a forklift? Well, l let me ruminate about that a little bit. Even though I had dismissed God from my life at this time, God kept nudging me. Praise God. I didn't know that when God leads you to the edge of a cliff in life, you can trust him fully and let go. Only one of two things will happen, as someone has said. He'll catch you when you fall, or he'll teach you how to fly. Yeah. Amen to that. The time of crisis was many years ago. He taught me a great lesson. I learned that I must not hide my brokenness and sin from God. I must let him into the dark places which hurt the most. And for me, that meant my psychosexual confusion. And I could really trust my Father God and my brother Jesus. When I hide from myself, I hide from others and I hide from God. God is only real when we are real with him. Thomas Merton says, quote, the secret of my identity is hidden in the love and mercy of God. If I find him, I will find myself. If I find my true self, I will find him. The only one who can teach me to find God is God himself. Knowing that I was accepted and loved, thank you, Jesus allowed me to bring my brokenness and pain to the surface where it could be healed. Nothing is healed until it is surfaced. Now my heart had become a soft, had become soft, so full of love, so grateful, so thankful to God, our Father. And you know that a thankful person can't be bitter, and a bitter person can't be thankful. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. And now in these last few years, I began being attracted to things Catholic again. When you begin to realize that the love of God and the love of others is the whole reason for our entire existence, for me, the only church that made sense was coming back to the Catholic Church. Catholicism is the faith of love. So many people convert to Catholicism because it is the church of love. I grew up in the 40s and 50s when there was a total blackout on the issue of same-sex attraction. So it took some time before I could face my own psychosexual issues, which I experienced when I was a young man. I realized that the time I began working with my first SSA client in 1984, that God, our good father, had called me to do this work as a counselor and therapist, I had a personal sensitivity to this issue because of my own background 
and also because he knew I needed to undergo a deeper healing in my own life. I began to discover that like my clients, I needed to resolve family of origin and emotional issues underlying my psychosexual confusion. Anyone who is involved in ministry work knows that ministry is always mutual. God calls you to serve others, but at the same time, he starts working on you in a deeper way. Next slide. Here's the way I wrote about how same-sex attraction develops in my book. It somewhat describes my own experience, and perhaps it'll describe the experience of many people that are here. From the time you were very young, you began to feel different. Uh, and listen, kind of listen to the words that I'm emphasizing. You were unsure of yourself. You were less confident than others. You were less, less assertive. You had fears and anxieties. You were very sensitive about things, even hypersensitive. What others brushed aside lightly seemed to bother and trouble you more deeply. These emotional differences started to make you feel alone and very self-conscious. You started to compare yourself with others and found yourself falling short. You were self-critical, self-condemning, and self-judging. Perhaps you didn't feel worthwhile, significant, or really important to anyone. You felt like you were not understood or accepted, and you started a life of hiding pretending, denying, and covering up the real inside of you with a false, protective, and substitute self. As a result, you moved out of childhood with large parts of yourself buried, unsettled, or lost. Chronologically, you continue to grow and change year after year, but emotionally, you remain fixed and unfinished in childhood. You especially felt shame. Shame is a feeling of being incomplete or having failed at being a person. It's a sense of yourself as not good enough or adequate. Shame tells you that you should be something better or different than who you are. Shame makes you feel unacceptable about who you are. All those feelings which were uncomfortable and unacceptable were really happening to me. And... They were hid deep inside of me. To hide them, to pretend that they don't exist, is to feel that you don't exist because when we are children, we are our feelings. To invalidate your feelings is to say that you don't exist. You become a body, a shell, without a self. You lack intimacy with yourself. That sensitive inner child of feelings remains hurt and hidden in you even though you are now an adult. Your feelings often do not match your age. You don't trust them. They are too disturbing to you. You don't trust yourself, and you don't let anyone else know you are really who you really are. A full-scale self-rejection begins to take place, and with it went your sense of yourself as a male or female, your gender security, and so you became what I call gender empty. As you get a little older, you start to notice something else which embarrasses you. You begin to have to admit to yourself that you're more curious and attracted to the same sex people than to the opposite sex. You like their attention. You like this one person's attention. You crave his interest. He intrigues you. You envy him and want to be like him. His attitudes, his behavior, His way of walking and talking and looking fascinates you. You're embarrassed that you watch his body, its grace and movement. You're embarrassed how primitive and sensual some things strike you, the sound of his voice or even an electrifying touch of him. And now you even start to want a relationship with him, an intimacy with him. You are trying, really, to recreate that lost self. Now you're a little older, and it's all becoming sexualized. You're surprised and excited when a same-sex person hugs you, a touch, a casual arm around the shoulder, a pat on the back is something that means a lot to you. Another same-sex person brushing up against you is noticed and makes you hungry 
for more contact, more intimacy, closeness, nudity, pornography, lusting with your eyes, falling in love, getting emotionally attached, feeling jealous and empty without him, all these things start to preoccupy you. And finally, you have to admit it. You have to say those words inside yourself that represent a turning point. I'm homosexual. The causes of homosexuality are sometimes difficult to pin down. And that's why many speak not about homosexuality as a singular thing, but as they speak about homosexualities, that is, one person's homosexual development is uh, very different from another person. Same-sex attraction, for instance, is also age-related and type-related. Some men are exclusively attracted to older men, others to only adolescents or young men with pronounced masculine builds, or the opposite, soft, effeminate demeanors. Some are attracted to the innocence and vulnerability of the prepubescent child. There is great variation. What may be common to all is that there is a mystique about the same gender. That mystique, that something different and unknown about the attractive person makes him or her attractive. It it is also there for heterosexual men when they look at a woman. There is an allure, a pull, uh, almost a trance that an attractive person holds. It's not always erotic either. It's a combination of responses and effects which people have on each other. Examples. The handsome waiter in the restaurant is going about his usual routine and turns to you, gives you a friendly smile, looks you right in the eyes, and says, what can I get you to drink? And you're going gaga goo goo as if he invited you out on a date. The big masculine policeman with his knee-high leather boots, his holstered gun strapped around his bullet-lined belt, his smartly creased uniform with epaulets and uh, badges stands there towering next to you, and you're going gaga goo goo inside. You hope he will arrest you for something. You hope he will arrest you for anything. (laughs) The attractions are not just about physical characteristics, but have to do with subtle, unrecognized emotional signals and other the other person sends. The person is making contact with me, makes me feel wanted, accepted, loved. This person creates a sense of comfort or security or control or domination or submission, to name a few. Subtle, unrecognized emotional signals, almost as delicate as an aroma, a scent, or a smell. And there are biological, or you can ask, are there biological, chemical, neurological, and genetic factors in the development of homosexuality, as well as environmental, uh, developmental, and social ones? Well, since a human being is such a complex person, Inter, with, with intricate interwoven systems all wrapped up and interacting together. We ought not to rule them out, though we know that there's no such thing as a gay gene, for instance. But allowing for biological, chemical, neurological, and genetic fa- factors does not threaten the way we Catholics make moral and ethical decisions regarding sexual expression. Our theological anthropology is not changed by the discovery of such factors. The origins of homosexuality may be obscure, but the light of scripture and the teachings of our mother church are a bright light guiding us to truth. God has spoken about human sexuality. After a number of years of counseling with people, I've summarized the issue of SSA in this way. Even though I don't understand all the causes, I would say that it at least has to do with experiences and responses. Experiences 
and responses. That is, things that happened to you or you were exposed to which sent you messages about yourself and your sexuality and emotional ways in which you responded to those experiences. I believe these make up six stages, one leading to the other. Low self-esteem, gender emptiness, gender attraction, sexual attraction, homosexual reinforcement, and homosexual identity. The first stage is a weak sense of self-esteem, or LSE, low self-esteem, caused by a combination of inner and outer factors which make a person feel inadequate or deficient. Shame is all a part of that. In a sensitive child, which most SSA people are, having one's emotions and feelings acknowledged, understood, accepted, and responded to gives the young child an adequate and acceptable self or self-esteem, a sense of how I feel about myself, my worth, my significance, my lovableness, my adequacy. This is for every child a major uh, emotional achievement in the life cycle of the self. But if some kinds of emotional experiences, lear learnings, and even and events occur which distort a good sense of self, it establishes a foundation that also interferes with an adequate sexual identity. Um, for a long time, I could not remember most of my childhood between ages one and, so let's say, ten. And I find that in, uh, to be the case with a lot of my clients. They, they don't know what, uh, they can't describe their childhood. And, and I conclude from that that it was messy, that it was disturbing, that it was difficult in some kind of emotional ways. Sometimes I'll ask them to bring in photos of their uh, family or their childhood, and we sit down, go over those photos, talk about what they mean, what they represent, and you can often discover a lot of things through photos. But that uh, insecure foundation that I call LSE leads to what I call gender emptiness, a gender insecurity. These interfere with the processes of and they're not up there, actually, of identification, intimacy, and imitation, which every child must make with others of their own gender in order to form a secure gender identity. At this stage, there is no choice involved. This is all happening. These first three stages is just a process that's happening. It just, uh, there's, no, no, there's no choosing these things. For me, there was just no way I could identify or form a relationship with my first generation Italian father who spoke, who spoke broken English and who was a fisherman who sold smelly fish from door to door, uh, nor my super macho brother who was 10 years older than myself. It was just impossible for me to find a connection with those two people in my life. As I got older, and my father got older. Um, we formed a tremendously wonderful bond. Uh, just a little story about Italians, Italian fishermen. He would drive his truck through the streets of the town with his fish box and his fish, and like they did in Italy, he would have a horn, and uh, so big, and he would blow that horn, and that would alert people that the fisherman was here, and he'd yell out, O pesci, O pesci, fish. And people would come out and then buy his fish. When I resolved things with my father, as he got older, I got older, and we had this nice bond together, I saved that horn. That horn is precious to me. And the oarlocks from his rowboat are precious to me now. And the beautiful brass needles that he made, which are so long, to mend his net, his nets, uh, are precious to me. And I can remember <clears throat> him sitting uh, in the sun on a Sunday afternoon, mending his nets with the radio on in his 51 Chevy, playing uh, Italian opera, and he's singing along with it. <laughs> and as a dumb adolescent, I was ashamed of that. But 
Now I love it. And I've recaptured my Italian heritage in so many ways. Well, thirdly, this gender emptiness results in both an emotional need for and an attraction of the same gender. I call this gender attraction. And you can understand why. Because there's an empty gender emptiness in you. And if that gender emptiness is in you, then you, you've, you're going to be attracted to the same gender. And it, at this stage, it's not even sexual. I'm going to be attracted to someone who has what I perceive that I don't have, perhaps a spontaneity and athleticism, an extroversion, a self-confidence, an assertiveness, a certain appearance of energy or spirit compared to myself, who may be just the opposite, fastidious, cautious, lonely, introverted, melancholic. This attraction stage involves no choice it just happens. In fact, this early, this early gender attraction stage is really an attempt of the child, without him even knowing it, to repair his gender emptiness. So he's looking to others to fill what was missing in his life. I've got to tell you a very poignant story about the author Oscar Wilde you may know of the famous author of a hundred or more years ago who was a notorious homosexual, finally even went to jail for two years for sodomy. And uh, he's the author of the, the most famous author of the book, uh, Picture, Picture of Dorian Gray, which is worthwhile for people to read from a perspective of SSA. Although he hides it in there, that's what he's talking about. <laughs> He tells when he was a young boy in Dublin, Dublin coming home from school one day and a girl jumps out of an alley and snatches the gray cap from his head and tosses it to a group of lower class boys who pass his hat from hand to hand. He's trying to get his hat back and he starts crying and he runs from them so that they would not see his tears. As I ran, he, a leg came out and tripped me, he said, and I lay upon the muddy ground, my nice clothes all muddy, not daring to rise, just crying. He said, and then I felt a hand upon my shoulder, and a boy of my own age helped me to my feet. He told me not to mind boys if they acted naughty, and he sat and talked with me with interest on the doorstep of that squalid dwelling, and then he felt silent, and I felt ashamed. He picked up my cap from the muddy street. He handed it to me and solemnly wished me a good morning. He went on his way through the terrible rookeries of Dublin. He walked away slowly, and I wished to run after him, but some feeling of shame, shame just prevented me. And he concludes by saying, I have been searching for that boy all my life. That's gender attraction. The fourth stage is sexual attraction, or SSA. When adolescence kicks in with all the raging hormonal and erotic impulses, what was GA, gender attraction, now becomes sexualized, understandably. Beginning in adolescence, a person is getting ready for intimate relationships, affectionate relationships, sexual relationships. When I was 15 years old, I had an intense romantic interest in a particular girl. But when that relationship ended, which I thought in retrospect, there was an awfully early time in my life to be so romantically passionate in love with this girl. But when it ended, my relationship with girls cooled completely and my SSA surfaced more prominently. And I think I was so deeply hurt by the loss of that first attempt at love that, uh, that it undermined my sense of my masculinity because in some sense I was proving by that relationship that I was masculine male. The fifth stage, this sexual attraction now becomes expressed and ritualized in various forms of same-sex behavior. I call this homosexual reinforcement, or HR. 
masturbation, pornography, emotional dependency, sexual encounters, and the most common is visual indulgence, that obsessive looking for attractive people. The sixth stage, when a person reinforces his SSA and is unwilling or unable to, as he thinks, control these behaviors, he will become convinced that he must live as a gay person. So the last stage, these last stages really are ones in which there are decisions made and uh, he chooses a, a lifestyle along that line. Same-sex attraction, I should say, is really not about sex. And we really ought to get that straight. The real underlying issues have to do with seeing yourself as an adequate male or an adequate female, comparing yourself with other males, wanting acceptance, listen to these words, wanting acceptance, being un un identified with other males or by males as an adequate male, belonging to other people in meaningful friendships, feeling liked, loved, cared about, feeling included by other males, and knowing that you have a male friendship with someone who is genuinely interested in you. These, these are the underlying things about SSA. The intense emotional need for these missing experiences becomes sexualized and eroticized if they're not met. Next slide. Please note that something else here takes place, and this is an important focus in counseling as I see it for me with the SSA people. You may not consciously realize it, but as you go through these stages, you actually form a relationship with your SSA as if it were another person, and that's not too far from the truth for it's typical for SSA people to feel as if they are two of themselves, a Christian person who wants to be virtuous and free of sin, and this other uh, person who is uh, sexual and sinful, like they're two people. There's an inner division, and this weighs on your heart. A house divided against itself cannot stand, and that's why SSA people often experience a lot of emotional trouble. There's an inner war raging, and this kind of self-directed criticisms or pity leads to devitalized living and functioning, depression, discouragement, and for some people, despair. Many SSA Christians suffer from underlying clinical depression or intermittent uh, self-hatred. <clears throat> the work of counseling and the grace of God are directed at integration and wholeness of ending this inner division. So you can ask what kind of relationship, and here I'm talking to the SSA people, what kind of relationship do you have with your SSA? How do you feel about it? What unconscious name have you given it? Think about the name that you've given it or names that you've given it. Do you think of it as a nuisance, a burden, uh, an embarrassment, an annoying cross, a source of continuous defeat, discouragement, unfortunate fate of yours? Do you feel it's the devil's grip on you or even view it as a curse? Is it a cross you have to carry, a thorn in your side? You may hate it. You may feel angry at it. You may feel sorry for yourself, feel it's unfair, or feel agonizing self-pity or discouragement. And what if I said to you, that your SSA is not a condition, but a journey, and even an adventure. See if that can shake the SSA in you. How would that change things for you? What if I said, instead of rejecting it or fighting with it, you embraced it, you befriended it, not the act of it, but the fact of it. How would that affect your life? So notice people form an emotional relationship with their same-sex attraction issue so that it's, and it's a relationship which is very important to uncover, examine, and resolve, I feel, in the counseling process. 
You cannot despise or dislike one part of yourself without it causing you to dislike the whole of you. It's like an untreated wound which continues reinfecting your whole body. But to recognize and truly believe that God is working his 828 process through your SSA is to say deep within yourself, I trust you, Lord Jesus. I am relying on you, Lord. I place my faith in you. I know you love me. I thank you, Father God. I am putting my hope in you. I am your child, and I'm depending on you, Father. So notice the words, trust, reliance, faith, love, thankfulness, hope, dependence. These are the words of a person whose heart is, I think, touching the heart of God. These are the words God wants to hear from us because they are words arising from the Holy Spirit speaking in us to the heart and Father and to Jesus. When we think about it, these words were commonly used by Jesus and Mary, the words also of the saints. When we use words like this, then the secular culture, our sinful flesh, and the evil one cannot undermine your progressive healing and holiness. I hope your prayer language is full of trust, reliance, faith, love, thankfulness, hope, dependence. It's, I'm certain it's a grace given by God when you truly desire it and seek it as a child of the Father God. Jesus prayed, I thank you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to little children. I'm going to skip the next slide, I think. Let's, let's go to it. Yeah, let's skip Fred. <laughs> It's an example that takes a long time to elaborate, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for the sake of time, skip it. A godless generation. Same-sex attraction in Catholics uh, who live with that uh, live in a faithless, godless time, a time when it says in Romans 1, 21, 24, although they knew God, they neither, neither glorified him nor gave God thanks but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were dark and therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. God gave them over to shameful lust. Why is this happening? It says because although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to God. There's a capsule summary from St. Paul about this whole issue in my mind. Western civilization is trying to live without God and God is giving this age over to itself. We are repeatedly, we are seeing re the same thing that happened in the Old Testament. Eventually sin becomes suffocating and self-destructive and people cry out in repentance and seek God again. I don't know if you can step out in faith with that verse. So many people are complaining about what's going on in our society around this issue. But I wonder, I believe, I wonder and believe and hold faith that God is giving them over right now. This is a giving over time until it becomes so intolerable to live in the filth of sin that finally they cry out and run back to God. How good to hear Pope Francis say in his inaugural homily, we all need to be protectors of God's plan inscribed in nature. And he didn't just mean Mother Nature. He meant the natural law, the natural law which establishes heterosexuality in the marriage of a man and a woman as the norm. Next slide. As sincere and committed Christians, we must not be caught by the pervasive propaganda which uh, we must believe that God has a plan for us. And I'm speaking to, again, SSA people when I say that. God has a plan for you. It's a plan with many blessings. We saw God's plan when he told Noah to build an ark and everyone laughed at him until the flood came. God had a plan when he parted the Red Sea. God 
had a plan when Joseph was sold into slavery and he became the prince of Egypt. God had a plan when Elijah was fed day and night by the ravens. There was a plan when the leper Naaman washed seven times in the Jordan and came out with skin as clean and smooth as a baby's and began to worship the God of Israel. Wasn't Jesus the Father's greatest plan for all the world? Worthy is the Lamb. Didn't God have a plan when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, to the widow at Nyan, for the daughter of Jairus, for Lazarus, for Nicodemus, for Levi the tax collector, for Zacchaeus up in the tree, for Peter when he gave him the keys, and John and Paul on his way to Damascus, for the paralyzed man who picked up his stretcher and went home, for the insane man of Gadara who was seen in his right mind, are not many discovering God's plan for their lives at Fatima and Lourdes and La Salette and Guadalupe when Jesus sends his mother to us. Of course, of course he has a plan for SSA people. You are not abandoned. And I think that plan is embedded in Romans 8.28. 8. He says, love me. And I'll make all things work together for your good. The word of God says that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he steal, kill, and destroy? Your hope, your trust, your faith, your confidence that God who began a good work in you will complete it. That God makes all things work together for good. Right from the beginning, in the garden, the evil one made the woman believe a lie. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? But we have another woman, Holy Mary, mother of all goodness, free us from these lies of the devil. Listen to Romans eight. 32, he who did not spare his own son, who gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? When you, with the grace of God, adopt a Romans 8.28 perspective in your heart about your same-sex attraction, your relationship with the Father, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, becomes your central priority. God becomes the center of your life's energy, your heart, and your treasure, not your SSA. And this causes you to view your SSA issue as God views it. The shift brings you hope and trust and assurance, and it removes the shame and blame. It strengthens you to live a chaste life. And I'm saying that from my own experience. I'm saying that from the experience of a lot of people that I work with. Next slide. One of the most elusive but important things to uncover in counseling is what I call the wall. SSA people often have an emotional wall around themselves. And this wall, built of protective defenses and porcupine needles, must be breached in order to get the picture, porcupine needle, must be breached in order to for real personality change to occur. Opening windows and doors in this wall has a lot to do with your personal happiness. After years of working with SSA people, I don't need to be more than two feet away from them and I can see the wall. The wall's there. Somebody is hiding behind that wall. Inside the wall, inside the SSA person, there's pain and much hurt and perhaps sensitive open wounds from childhood, a wounded child within. And that's why he develops a false self, which he presents to the world. If you only knew the real me, I know you would not like me. I know you would reject me and you would be repulsed by me if you knew the real me. So I will not show you the real me. I keep it hidden the me that's depressed a lot, discouraged, disgusted with himself, full of shame and self-blame. Who could want a person like that for a friend? Who could ever love a person like that? So I try to provide a safe counseling relationship, allowing the Spirit of Christ to use me as a vehicle of love so that the person can risk sharing what he feels like 
behind that wall. And that's often a breakthrough in counseling when that wall opens and its doors and windows and the person begins to share what it really feels like inside. The wall has kept them safe, but it's also made them a prisoner. No one can get inside, which creates a painful, sad loneliness. In truth, only love can allow the wall to be opened up. And you know, in counseling, the number of times, you can think about this phenomenon, the number of times that I've seen men with SSA start reaching out to a woman is when that woman breaks through the wall and he feels it. And, and that's when love starts working in his heart. How we want someone to come inside our wall and sit with us with an arm around our wounded hearts. I don't want any answer to this question, but I, I, I want to ask, is anybody hearing from the Lord this morning? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Father and I arranged that. No. <laughs> we didn't. That just happened. I, I, I won't say anything about it. In counseling or any sustained caring relationship, a person experiences a corrective emotional experience of complete acceptance. And this can unfold like a flower in the sun, and the person can start opening up to life. No wonder we love Jesus so much because he is the wall breaker. He himself is our peace, scripture says, who has broken down every wall. People felt his intense, divine, unconditional love. God is love. Jesus is God. Here is Jesus who is love walking about, and everyone who encountered him were transformed by his divine love. Jesus was right to left setting captives, captives free. He is endlessly, enduringly attractive. He's a magnet of the Father's love, which we all need. Remember the woman at the well. It was his love which changed her. Remember the woman with the bleeding condition. It was his love which healed her. And his mother, our blessed mother, is still, is still distributing his love wherever she appears. No wonder Mary comes to earth every so often because the love of the Father and the love of the Son cannot hold back heaven's love from us. And this is when real change takes place, when love finds an opening in the wall. Next slide. I took <clears throat> my grandchildren to one of those cornfield mazes which some farms sponsor every autumn. Do you know about those? The corn stalks were about my head height, and I couldn't see over them, and you're supposed to get through the maze in about a half an hour. But we kept getting lost. Uh, I had my youngest grandson, my oldest grandson, and my only granddaughter. So the youngest grandson, Jeffrey, said, Papa, are we done yet? I'm getting tired. <laughs> and the oldest grandson, Christopher, wise guy, said, Papa, do you know where you're going? <laughs> and, my, and my granddaughter, Jordan, uh, who's so wise and, and, and intelligent, said, just follow me, I'll show you how to get out of here. <laughs> Finally, we come to a 10-foot ladder left there for people like me, I think. And I think, in fact, it had a sign on it that said, this is for lost papas. <laughs> and the guy goes, some guy that was with us goes up the ladder and figures out the turns. We have to make four turns, and we would be at the exit 
from but from inside the maze it becomes very confusing because you don't have a higher perspective and SSA is like that for so many Christians they don't have a higher perspective this perspective is from the inside of the maze they can't see the bigger picture they need to get above it they need to see God's heavenly spiritual perspective to find their way out and that's God's plan and I think it's it's all about this Romans 828 verse of scripture. Those Christians and Catholics I know who have been most successful at resolving and managing SSA in their lives are those who have wholeheartedly embraced a higher spiritual perspective in which their SSA is lived out as being used as God desires to save, sanctify, and transform them into the likeness of Christ Jesus, a perspective that's so important for their salvation, their sanity, and their sanctification. Next slide, please. Believe it, seek it, live it. Um, I try to make a strong case based on my years of counseling with numerous people for this important psychological and spiritual way of viewing SSA. I've tried to show you that our Father and our Savior who came to save sinners and broken people like ourselves in need of a physician do not view SSA as an obstacle but as a potential asset to our holiness. I'm convinced that God wants you to have this higher, transformed, heavenly perspective. Psychologically, it means a genuine acceptance of the reality of same-sex attraction in your life, a genuine self-acceptance, a coming to peace with yourself about it. But more importantly, it means uh, lining yourself up with God's perspective and plan, a belief that God is working through your SSA for your holiness, your sanctification, and his glorification. Adopting this kind of perspective sanctifies you and glorifies God. What glorifies God sanctifies you. What sanctifies you glorifies God. If you're not sure if you have already adopted this kind of perspective, then you know what I invite you to do? I invite you to take Romans 8.28, go in the chapel, go before the Blessed Sacrament, and take a few words at a time, or even one word at a time. I know that all things are working together for good, for me, because I love you, Lord, and I have been called according to your purpose. I invite you to spend that kind of time with the Lord. I think it will bless you. Secondly, you need to seek this Romans 8.28 perspective. I've said that this viewpoint is a grace and gift of God given to those who really seek it and believe in the goodness and love of God. You have to believe it's true and sincerely seek it. Jesus said, ask and you will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. It's likely that there are things that must be resolved and removed. Many need to do what I call family of origin work. Um, recognizing, expressing uncomfortable feelings. Many need to learn some strategies for maintaining chastity. Others need to work on dismantling. Most people need to work on dismantling that wall. Some people, and, uh, and there's a num number of people that I work with, men that is, uh, are struggling with out and out sexual addiction. And their biggest problem is not SSA, it's sexual addiction. And that takes another nuance of ways to work. And the first step of that is to honestly say, I am a sexual addict. And I'll say that to my clients. Can you say it? I am a sexual addict. And let it sink in. Let the Lord let that sink in. That's the beginning of your change process in terms of your chastity. And I also want to say a brief word to SSA people who feel most alienated in this whole group, potentially, and those who have to admit to themselves 
that they are sexually attracted to children, to prepubescent children. Erotic and emotional attraction to young children is a very heavy cross for anyone to carry. And of course, it has all kinds of legal and criminal ramifications, but there's help for you too. If that's what's going on in your life, there's help and hope. All things uh, God can work on. And it begins with placing faith and trust and love in God. Philippians 4, 6, 7. And nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So believe it, seek it, and finally, you must live it out. God expects you to live out the reality of this perspective. Placing your life in his hands is what pleases him, not having a perfect record of freedom from failure. It's your direction, not your perfection, that's most pleasing to God. None of us are going to achieve perfection. You may feel, Father God, I am always failing. I am not worthy to be called your son. But he says, I'm pleased that you chose this direction for your life, a life of chastity and faithfulness. And I know you have difficulty remaining chaste, but I am pleased with your commitment for he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. So I say to my clients who are Catholics, embrace everything that's Catholic. You want to know what you have to do? In part, you have to embrace everything that's Catholic. Our church is so rich. That's one of the things that brought me back to Catholicism. Our church is so rich with all the kinds of things that support holiness and the growth and sanctity. So embrace everything that's Catholic. Stay close to Jesus in the Gospels. Toward the end of his life, St. Philip Neri read nothing but the Gospels, and finally he read nothing but John's Gospel. I don't know if any of you are coming to that place in your own life. The most intimate, loving, Trinitarian gospel is John's gospel. Jesus is the word of God, says St. Ambrose. He is the mouth of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the voice of Jesus. A little joke for you. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip, and they had a pup tent, you know, this simple kind of tent that doesn't have a floor, just stands up like this as a triangle kind of thing. And uh, after they had fallen asleep, Watson wakes Holmes up in the middle of the night and says, Holmes, look up and tell me what you see. And Holmes said, I see a fantastic panorama of countless stars. And Watson says, but Holmes, what does that tell you? And Holmes says, astronomically, it suggests that to me that there's a billion other galaxies in the sky. Theologically, it tells me the vastness of space may be yet another suggestion of the greatness of God and how small and insignificant we are. Meteorologically, the blackness of the sky and the crispness of these stellar images it tells me that there is low humidity and stable air, and therefore we <laughs> most likely will enjoy a beautiful day tomorrow. Holmes pauses and says, why, what does it tell you, Dr. Watson? And Watson says, it tells me that someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Watson grasped, grasped what was most obvious. And what God is doing in the lives of SSA people may not be the most obvious thing. So we walk by faith. 